and we will be done. I promise I will try to keep these to less than 20 minutes, and hopefully I can keep that promise, but no promises. All right, so two things to know whether or not you're going to be able to predict the products or whether or not a reaction is actually going to occur, and this kind of goes with the SRDR lab that you guys just did. Um, you made a list with the single replacement reactions where you ranked the elements based on most reactive to least, and that is actually called an activity series. And the easier an element reacts, then the higher it's going to be on that list. And I, um, whoa, sorry, I went too fast there. Um, an activity series is just a list of elements that's organized according to, it depends on the list, but sometimes it's most reactive to least reactive, and then sometimes it's backwards. The one that I will give you is listed with the most reactive at the top. So with metals, the greater the activity, the easier it is to lose electrons because metals like to become cations. And... Oh, I put that right there. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself. Non-metals, the greater the activity, it's going to be the opposite. The easier it is for them to gain an electron or become an anion. So that's just how they're ranked and why, and that's why you will actually have two separate lists. You'll have a metals activity series and a non-metals activity series. And the purpose of this is it's used to predict whether or not a single replacement reaction will occur. Activity series are only used for single replacements. You don't use these on double replacements, you don't use them on synthesis, and you don't use them on decomps. Uh, the most active element is going to be the one that's higher on your activity series, and basically the rule is an element can replace anything below it, but not anything above it. And if you want to use the borderline inappropriate relationship analogy, if someone is going to dump who they are with to get with someone else, they're going to move up, not down. Um, and I will give you a copy of the activity series to use on the test so you don't in any way have to memorize that. So, just a couple of practices. Um, if you have zinc and hydrochloric acid, go to your list. If you don't have a list in front of you, then um, go online, just Google activity series and you'll find one. Just pick one. They're all pretty much the same. So, with zinc and hydrochloric acid, look at the reactants that you have. You have zinc plus hydrochloric acid, HCl. Well, zinc is going to take the place of the hydrogen. So we need to find zinc and hydrogen on our list and make sure that zinc is higher up than hydrogen. Because if not, then chlorine is going to stick with hydrogen. Because chlorine is only going to do a switch if it's a move up. And if you look at your activity series, you'll see hydrogen is about in the bottom third and zinc is about in the top third. So zinc is a serious step up for chlorine here, so this reaction will occur and you're going to produce zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. So this reaction will occur. Calcium and lead nitrate. So if we have pure calcium and lead nitrate, and it's lead 2 nitrate, so it's going to be PbNO3 two, is this going to react? Well, look at your list and find calcium and find lead. Calcium is up near the very top and lead is in the bottom half. So again, nitrate will switch partners because calcium is a step up. So you're going to form calcium nitrate and lead and this one is also balanced so we're good. And this one will occur. So I'll put a little check mark just for consistency. Alright, copper and lithium sulfate. So we have pure copper and we have lithium sulfate, Li2SO4. And looking at your list, you'll see that lithium is at the very top of the list. So basically what that means is sulfate is already with the best that the metals have to offer. So copper isn't looking really appealing and so this reaction will not occur. So you would just simply put no reaction. RxN is the abbreviation for reaction. <clears throat> bromine and iron two chloride. These, uh, let's see, you got bromine. Whoa, sorry. Br2. Iron two chloride is going to be FeCl2. Now, bromine is a nonmetal, so it's going to take the place of the nonmetal, the chlorine in here. And so, to look to see whether or not this is going to react, you're going to look at the activity series of the halogens. And if bromine is higher on the list than chlorine, then this will react. And if you look at your list, chlorine is actually higher, so iron's going to stick right where he is, and we're not going to have a reaction. <coughs> All right, solu oh, sorry. solubility is used for double replacement, 
and double replacement only. Um, it's used to predict whether or not you're going to get a precipitate. So when you guys did the double replacement um, reactions in the lab and some of them made solids and some of them just kind of sat there and did nothing, um, the solubility rules would have helped you predict whether or not something was going to happen. And if in the solubility rules a compound is listed as either insoluble, slightly soluble, or marginally soluble, then we're going to consider that that formed a precipitate and it would be written as a solid in the reaction. If a compound is listed as soluble, then it's going to stay aqueous. It's not going to come out of solution and become a solid. Now, if you have the Holt Modern Chemistry book, then you can look up the solubility rules on page 427. I will give you a copy to use on your test, and if you don't have this book, then again, just Google search solubility rules, and you'll find what you need. So you might want to do that before we get to this slide, which is all practice. So will this produce a precipitate, and if so, what is the precipitate? So looking at these, the easiest way to use your solubility rules is to memorize a couple of them and then just kind of look up the rest of them. And the ones that I would suggest memorizing, um, sodium and other group one metals are always soluble. So they will never form a precipitate. Um, nitrates, anything that contains the nitrate ion is also always soluble. And then the other one that I would suggest memorizing is the halogens, so that's group 17, is pretty much always soluble, except if you have silver, mercury, or lead. If you have any of these three metals bonding to a halogen, then it is going to form a precipitate. But anything else, the group 17 will be soluble. And the reason I say just go ahead and memorize these is so that as we're getting to them, like on this first one, ammonium sulfide and cadmium nitrate. Nitrate. That means any compound that contains nitrate is going to be soluble and will not produce a precipitate. Um, and so we can basically cancel out anything that bonds to nitrate, which leaves us, because this these are all double replacement reactions, and so you'll have ammonium sulfide, NH42S plus cadmium nitrate, CDNO32, yields and so what's going to happen here is you're going to switch your positive ions. Well, we already know that ammonium nitrate is going to be soluble, so it will not be a precipitate. So we could put NH4NO3, and it's going to stay aqueous. Well, then the other one, cadmium sulfide, CDS. I'm going to look at my... Um, solubility rules and I see that one of my solubility rules says most sulfide salts are not soluble. So cadmium sulfide is going to be my precipitate. One more thing that you can memorize I forgot to say with ammonia, NH4, things that contain ammonium ion are going to be always soluble. And it helps like I said to remember the always solubles so that um, you can know just to go ahead and cross things out uh, as not going to form a precipitate. So let's just kind of work through these real quick. We got potassium sulfate, K2SO4, plus barium chloride, BACL2. Well, I see I have potassium here, which is a group one metal. Group one metals, always soluble. So I know that when um, potassium and barium switch places, potassium is now going to be with chlorine. Well, this is a double whammy, so we got a group 1 with a group 17, so that's really, really aqueous. Um, and then I have barium sulfate. And no, I didn't balance these up there. Uh, balancing's on another thing. Barium sulfate, I'm going to look at my solubility rules, and I see that I have a, um, a rule that says sulfates are soluble. Exceptions are those containing barium, lead, mercury, and calcium. Well, I got barium right there, so that means this is going to be a precipitate. <coughs> sodium nitrate and magnesium sulfate. So I have sodium nitrate plus magnesium sulfate. And 
these guys, I'm going to look at this and go, okay, sodium compounds, always soluble. So when sodium and magnesium switch places, I'm going to make sodium sulfate, which is going to be aqueous, and I'm going to make magnesium nitrate. And nitrates are always um, aqueous. And so that means since both of my products are aqueous, this is actually going to be no reaction. Because if you don't form a precipitate, then you can't actually see anything happening. Now on the last one, I have nickel chloride, nickel 2 chloride specifically, and lithium hydroxide. And I'm going to switch these two guys, and I can see my lithium and my chlorine. Well, lithium's a group 1, chlorine's a group 17, so that's really soluble, so that's going to stay aqueous. Plus the uh, nickel hydroxide. The nickel will stay nickel too because this is not a redox reaction. Nickel hydroxide. And I'm going to look at my solubility rules. And I see that most hydroxide salts are not soluble. Um, soluble, sorry about the bell there. Soluble hydroxides are group 1 metals and the um, top half of group 2. Well, this is not a group 1 or a group 2, so that means this is going to be solid. Um, things to know for your test, I guess this really doesn't need to be on the video, so y'all can look at this on the notes. And that, ladies and gents, is all I have. And I would like to point out that I promised y'all less than 20 minutes, and this sucker is 11 and a half minutes, so hmm, I rule. Y'all have a great day.